talking about is the rules of the game. And this is Renee Seal. I am one of the social science student leaders. We also have Paige and Diego with us here today and then our leader, Leah. And today we are interviewing our professor here on campus, Sean Patterson. And basically we're just gonna go and go through some basic interview questions and you can answer them however you see fit. So just jumping right in, um, first off, what is your role at Southern Oregon University? What classes do you teach? And what does your typical work day look like? Well, hello, um, I'm Sean Patterson. I am an assistant professor of political science here at SOU. In the fall, I taught the campaigns and elections class and the public opinion class. Now I'm teaching more of the, the political institutions side of things. So I'm teaching uh, a course on the presidency, a course on the Supreme Court and uh, civil liberties, and I'm teaching the introduction to American politics class. Um, I'm also affiliated with the Honors College, and so I'm teaching the uh, quantitative research methods quick course, short course uh, in the Honors College. Next term, I'll be teaching money and politics. Uh, uh, a, a class that I've been working on in my brain for a long time, which will either be great or horrible. Uh, the politics of dystopia. We're going to like read dystopian novels and watch dystopian movies and, and talk about how it's actually real. Um, so, I, oh, and of course, my favorite class, political parties. Will be teach, I'll be teaching political parties next next term. So, uh, if, if you if you can dream it, I teach it in political science. Um, what does a normal day look like? Well, it, it's really hard to speak to, of like what a normal day looks like in such an abnormal year. Um, but most most days I, I wake up, I can't think straight, I can't see or focus at all. So I get a cup of coffee, I have a cup of coffee, the whole world comes into sharp clarity. Um, I usually I usually start my day with, uh, with with our with our live zoom lectures for the course um, with with our transition to remote learning i'm in st louis and all of you are in oregon and so you know using those time zones to my advantage i start my day with with our classes and then i spend most of the afternoon writing lectures for the next week responding to student emails trying to get some some work done on my own research things like that um but as for what a normal day looks like i'm really excited to find out what a normal day looks like i feel like that's very true for all of us we're getting into yeah. a norm, new, new normal routine but um next up is what does your education and career path look like what led you to your field so where'd you study all that good stuff so i grew up in delaware which if you learn two things about Delaware, first, Joe Biden. Second, the, like the only industry in Delaware is chemicals. Dow, DuPont, AstraZeneca, these are all the companies that exist in Delaware. And so I started an undergrad as a chemical engineer. And I fell asleep at the end of one of my orgo classes. And as I was waking up, the American presidency was coming in. And I knew my roommate was in that class. So I was like, ah, like rather than like awkwardly try and like sneak out because I, I, I missed the miss the exchange. I'll just sit and I'll, I'll watch the uh, I'll, I'll just hang out for the American presidency. And Wendy Schiller at Brown was teaching a class on Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. And I was like, this is much better. And so I became a political scientist. Um, so then after I uh, finished at Brown. I did my PhD at UCLA in Los Angeles. Then I did a one-year postdoc at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And then I started as an assistant professor here at SOU in the fall. You have been everywhere. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, so next up, uh, during any point in your career path, did you ever face a significant challenge and what led you to overcome it? And do you have any advice to any current students dealing with barriers? When, so, so on, uh, on the one hand, I want to say no. I want to say that pretty much 
professionally, I have been the luckiest person on, on the face of the earth. Like most of these lucky things just kind of like lined up at the very last minute and, and everything has been very smooth. So in that way, like I'm, I'm so fortunate, like I have a great job. I, I, I had a, I had a much better time in grad school than most. And so I want to say no, um, I haven't, but you know, grad school was a very trying time. And it, it, you know, a lot of undergrads, when, when they, when they start grad school, you know, it's going to be hard learning. Like I'm here to like really learn. It's like, it's personally a, 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 a difficult time in your life as well. And I think people don't take into consideration enough how important your social support network is in that process. And so like my one piece of advice is when you're transitioning to the next, the next big adventure, don't downplay factors that you know, might not make sense on paper, but things like being close to your family, being in an area of the country where you feel comfortable, things like that, having a, having a, a, a solid personal life will provide you a lot of benefits when you're in grad school and make the process a lot more rewarding and you're going to get a lot more out of it. Um, you know, for example, like being in Los Angeles with my whole family in Philadelphia and, and that, you know, being a six hour plane ride apart for eight years made the grad school process more of a, more of a, a drag than it needed to be. But I'm, look, I'm here at SOU getting to teach political science classes. Like I, clearly nothing, nothing, there weren't, there weren't too many roadblocks. That is very true. And it sounds like you've really been drawn to the West Coast then if you keep coming back here, it seems like. I just, I, I mean, I just, just, <laughs> My, my dissertation project involved studying uh, local political parties. And so I spent years three and four of grad school visiting, I think, 40 states. And so like, if, if, you, can, if you can even think of a state, I've probably been there and I've probably talked to the city council member or at least their, at least their uh, chief of staff. <laughs> That actually is perfectly lead into the next question, which what research projects are you currently working on? Oh, so when I, when I was in grad school, I got roped into this project with a, with a senior faculty member there. Uh, the, the big umbrella research question being, how do political parties actually operate on the ground? How, you know, what are they doing out in the community, out in the world? How are they organizing? politics on a, on a more local level. And so we went and we spoke to uh, candidates running for Congress, their campaign staff, interest groups, journalists, local political officials, party bosses, academics who studied local politics to get as many kind of eclectic but comprehensive understandings of like local politics around the country. And so we're currently working on taking what's about like 600 hours of interviews and boiling it down into, um, into a book that explains how interest groups influence congressional primaries and sends champions for their local issues to Congress. And some other stuff, I think. My Dropbox suggests that I'm doing a lot more than just that one project, but uh, that that's the big one, and that's the one that that has the, the fun sales pitch associated with it. That sounds like a very large undertaking, but a really rewarding one. Getting to travel, I feel like that's an awesome opportunity when you're doing research work. And 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 fortunately, you know, I I have four five amazing co-authors who are, who are working with me on this project. So we're all, it's, it's a huge project, but we're, we're all, we're all uh, contributing our different little bits of expertise to it. Awesome. So obviously you have not been teaching at SOU for very long, but, and you haven't even been on campus really, <laughs> at least uh, for fall or winter, but what is your favorite part about working, I guess, for Southern Oregon University since you're not actually here? 
I've really enjoyed having, I, I don't wanna say small classes. I wanna say reasonable sized classes. I can interact with all of my students one-on-one. -on -one. I get to know their names. I can, uh, you know, I can assign projects for, you know, to evaluate how, how the students are doing in the class that's like slightly more creative and slightly more interesting in a way that, uh, you know, I, I, when I was teaching at UCLA, when you have an enormous class of 200 students, you're, you're limited in the types of interactions you can have with your students, the types of evaluations you can use. And so, you know, th that's been my, you know, my favorite part about being at SOU so far teaching for SOU so far. I have to agree that that's part of the reason why I came here as a student, so it's definitely a highlight. Um, so how has the pandemic affected your teaching um, and learning individually, and what are some of the unexpected joys or struggles that you have manifest during this time period? Well, I, you know, I if, if it hasn't come across in this conversation so far, like, I'm kind of like, this of a person like I really enjoy being in the classroom I enjoy dancing around and and you know connecting with the students and and and, and, I, and I'm very excited about the material I, I'm, I'm passionate about political science I think it's exciting and I like the big struggle for me is this this little this little box does not convey my excitement as much as as I can convey in person and so that that's been for me the hardest part and but you know, behind Zoom, I can't really see into the students' eyes. Like when I'm in person, like I can tell in their souls whether or not they're following me or not. Like I can just see the light go on and off behind their eyes. I can't do it over Zoom, so I don't know if uh, if I'm if I'm connecting as well as as I did in the past. Um, one one like like I would say, uh, what is it? Silver lining, there we go, um, is when I taught my methods class last quarter, uh, that, that's a lot of sitting and learning how to code and how to make graphs and the, the screen sharing on Zoom, I actually think is a way more effective way of teaching a coding class than doing it in person. You know, me walking around the classroom and looking over your shoulder and being like, oh, wait, what are you doing? Is that right? I can't, uh, let's try it again. Now you can just share your screen and I can read your code really quick. And I'm like, oh, you missed a comma on line four. Pop that in there and run it again. So I think the the, the troubleshooting of my methods class had was a, was a little more streamlined, but again, you know, this is if if there's if there's one thing that I wish students knew, it's that like professors don't want to be doing this either. It it's way more work. It's way harder. It's thirty times less fun. We want to get back into the classroom with you guys as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe. Um, and so, but you know, it 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 hasn't been it hasn't been as bad as I thought it was going to be. But being being back in person will be so much better. I think we can all agree with that, especially the social science majors, that interaction is, I feel like 80% of the course sometimes, if not more than yeah. that. But moving away from, I guess, your professional life, what is something like a new talent or something that you've picked up during the pandemic outside of your professional role? Oh, outside of my professional role. I was yes. video <laughs> editing. I learned how to edit <laughs> videos. Um, what have I, what skill have I picked up in the pandemic? I'm trying to think like uh, it could be a hobby too. Like, I was like you know, my partner Hannah, like we like to we like to describe like seasons of the pandemic. Like season one was when we were making bread. Like that's what we did in season one. And then there was like season two where we were like like we would go for walks every day and like now that we're in like season four, like I can't even remember like the starting plot of what was going on or like things that I've accomplished. Um, is this a good question? This is a good question. Skills that I think. Arts and crafts maybe? Arts and crafts. We did do, we did, we, we got all the supplies to do the, um, like those wine and paint nights that we were going to just do at home. And we, we just kept it in the corner. And we were like, if, if we get so bored, 
now we have like a break glass in case of emergency. And again, my life has been like so cushy and wonderful. You know, lots of people experienced so many hardships this past year, but me and my partner were very fortunate. Both of our jobs transitioned online. So even though life was very different, we still had our nine to five work day, just like normal. And so we never got to the break glass in case of emergency boredom level. So I'm really sad because I don't think I've picked up any skills over the past year now, now, now that we're talking about it. Please don't feel like peer pressure into picking up a new hobby now. <laughs> so I guess this is kind of going off this. What do you enjoy doing in your free time? Um, this could be before the pandemic hit. What did you enjoy doing? Uh, outside of being a professor? <laughs> well, that was another, you know, big selling point for me for Southern Oregon is like, I, I really love being outside. And just kind of the, the, the natural beauty of Oregon is, is one of the things like I'm most excited about getting to, uh, getting to experience. And, you know, I already have my first trip to Crater Lake planned, like as soon as I'm there, I'm like, like that first long weekend, I'm like, yes, I am. I'm, I'm going hiking. I'm, I'm getting out. Um, you know, growing up in Delaware, going to school in Rhode Island, like these aren't, these aren't places we associate with the natural wonders of the world. Um, and so, so that's, that's something um, I'm, I'm very excited about. And then let's see if they'll, if they'll respond. I have two cats. So that's like my other thing. I'm trying, I really thought if I shook the treats that they would come, you want a treat? Come say hello. Yeah, come say hello. Come here. I can hear the meow. <laughs> and so I have, I have cats. So this is Minnie. <laughs> say hi. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so yeah, personal life. I like to be outside and I like to hang out with my cats. I'm like a very good balance of introvert and extrovert activities. <laughs> Um, and final question, do you have any words of wisdom or parting thoughts for anybody who's here or is going to be watching this later? Words of wisdom. I think that, I think that like if, if I could, if I could instill one thing in, in my students for, from like this period of time in our lives, it's that like everybody's having a hard time of things and the faculty understand that everybody's having a hard time of things and we want to help you as best we can but we can't help you if we don't know that things are amiss and so i've had i've had a couple students who have kind of just like fallen off the grid and you know then reach out to me at the end of the term and they're like oh like sorry like i just didn't want to like i want to know when things are are aren't working for you so that we can we can come up with a plan but you know but i can't help you i can't help everyone if if i if i don't know what's going on and so you know if if if, if you're you know experiencing any hardships or or you know you know you're, you're not being able to perform in the course as well as you'd want to like reach out to the faculty talk to them you know we're here, we're human, we're also experiencing this year and we know just how, how 2020, even 2021 is becoming. Um, and, and, you know, we're here to help. Yeah, I think that's my word, I think that's my word of wisdom. That's your words of wisdom. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, those were awesome. We're gonna open it up to anybody who has any questions to so type them in the chat. Um, if we don't get any, I know I personally have a couple that I'd like to ask you. I am one of your students currently, um, and so it's a I will first not time help political you science exam question. <laughs> the what? I was like, I won't ask oh, questions. And I'm I I am also the resident political scientist. So if people have political science questions, I, I'm happy to I'm happy to I'm an open book. So I was going to ask, what has been your favorite moment of you being a teacher? Like, what is the moment that you're like, this is going to stick with me forever? Okay, so like the one that like really hit me in the heartstrings was 
at the end of my last class at UCLA, I had had like a, a cluster of students who had just kind of like followed me class to class. And I didn't realize that I have this verbal tick, but they caught it and they got me this mug that says, but I digress. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I, I cherish this mug so much because I, I, and then as soon as they say it, it was like that scene in a, in a sitcom. I just like flashed back and I just heard myself say it a thousand times in a row. Um, so that was one, that, that was like one like little event. I think the thing that like the experience that I had that made me realize I, I wanted to be a teacher and that I needed to be a teacher was the first time I taught my political parties class because like you would think like, what's, what are we gonna be talking about in a political parties class? And you're gonna be like, man, Democrats and Republicans and they're fighting. No, no. no, we're gonna talk about chimpanzee social structure. We're gonna talk about genetic studies of tribes in Southeast Asia. We're gonna talk about babies. We're gonna talk about experiments we did on kids in the seventies. Like it, it's just such a, like, it, it just gave me the freedom to, to, to connect such a diverse array of, of scholarship to a question that I think is like really, really central to understanding how government works today. And that, you know, so like th that's been, that's been the most rewarding professional experience of teaching. Um, I don't know, did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, I think anybody who's ever thought of being an educator has had that kind of moment of like, oh, like maybe this is why I feel inclined to do this. So that's a really yes. great insight. Because like when you're first hired, there, there's like a lot of expectations among like the junior faculty to like to teach the nuts and bolts classes, like the the intro level classes, there's not a lot of flexibility. It's like, you know, we got to get them the, this base level of information or you're not a political scientist. And so th this political parties class was the first time that I kind of had like a little more free reign with with my syllabi and I could just be like, what do I think students need to learn? And, you know, we, we watch a lot of videos of chimpanzees fighting and we talk about what that actually means. We've um, talked about that same thing in my history class and many you start talking about, I was like, man, this is taking me back. I've talked about a lot of these same things in my um, women's history class and about eugenics and that kind of stuff, so. Students that fear the topic in classes of political science. So what would you recommend to these students to sign up for a political science class? I think that political science gets a, a, a bad rap as being kind of one of the scarier social sciences. Um, I think a lot of the skills that you learn in political science classes will help you in a variety of different fields. You know, political science is a, a, at its core the study of who gets what, when, where, and why. And so, you know, these, 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 are, these are concepts that will help you make sense of social relations in, in little groups on campus, all the way up to, you know, groups that, that affect, uh, you know, national politics. And so th there's, there's very few questions that I don't think uh, it, it, political science speaks to in some way when we're when we're thinking about the the social world around us, and so, you know, why would I recommend taking a political science class? Because at the end of the day, if you boil it down, most things that we interact with on a day to day basis are political in nature, and understanding how how power is contested in in that way uh, will help you make sense of of your life. So I had a question. So I know a lot of people in today's world kind of put on blinders when it comes to politics. They don't want to know. They just want to know who's my president, who, like, I don't want to know anything else outside of that. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it. How would you suggest for those people that don't want to get pulled by the emotional strands of politics to still stay up on current events and that kind of stuff? Democracy is like both Oh, how do I put this? Like, like I, the quote that gets thrown around too much is like Winston Churchill's. Like, democracy is a terrible form of government, but it's so much better than all the other things we've tried. Um, democracy is 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 both. You know, like when we think about democracy, the things that come to mind for most people are our rights, like 
you know, free speech, our, our right to free expression and things like that. But there's, there's an equal component of obligation to that, that the, the obligations on us as, as members of a free society are to be informed about the world around us. And if you want your voice to matter, you're, 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 you should be informed about the things that you're, you're hoping to contribute to. You know, many of the, the, in Rhode Island, and I don't know if this is still the case, but a, a long time ago in Rhode Island, uh, to be cremated, you had to purchase a casket, a wooden casket, and be put in the casket, and then the casket was put into the crematorium and burned up. Seems kind of weird, you know, we're, we're just cremating a body, you'd think you could just put that in the super duper hot oven. Well, when the when they were making the law to, to regulate crematoriums, the only people that came to the hearings were people who worked for funeral homes. Politics devolves to the most interested parties. And, you know, people who work for funeral homes make money selling caskets. So they said that it was unsanitary to cremate a body without a casket. And so, you know, so many aspects of our democracy kind of happen in the dark, happen out of the public eye. And the more that you can educate yourself on how the world is working around us, the, the better our government is going to work and the more representative it's going to be of, of the of, of public opinion. And I think the more people knew about how government worked, the better it would work in expectation. Oh, uh, I have a question. So um, another question that I would have would be, um, with all the topics that you study in your field or your career path, um, what is one of the fields that you think is the most interesting and the most um, kind of um, overarching um, Think uh, overarching aspect of uh, po like political science that you like would be super important to know about. I, I hope that's not too general. I get a little bit general sometimes. To, like, well, well, no, well, no, because you were like uh, uh, of all the things that you're interested in, like what's the most overarching? Like I was about to say space and physics because I love space and physics, but no, then you qualified it with political science. What's the most overarching aspect of political science that I think everybody should be aware of? I think understanding the mechanics of the electoral process, like, like the US has such a diverse and complicated set of rules for how we elect all of our different elected officials. And these different rules and these different institutions dramatically affect who represents us in these bodies that essentially, you know, influence so much of much of our life. You know, understanding how redistricting works for Congress is tremendously important for understanding who represents us in Congress and then eventually what Congress does. You know, understanding how the Senate was originally designed and how that, that malapportionment based off of, of states rather than population, you know, that's one of the most relevant points of contention in government today. And so just understanding, you know, if you just took a class on the mechanics of elections, that would help you understand so much of what, what's going on in, in government today. Can you speak to the barriers that keep folks from getting involved in our democracy? Yes, it's part of us to gauge, but some folks have easier access than others. Yes. I, it, this is one of those topics that's hard to talk about with in, an, in a nonpartisan lens. And, and, and so I, I want to be careful here, but there, you know, there are political groups who have an incentive to make it more difficult to participate in politics, to make it more difficult to vote, to make it more difficult to register to vote, to make it more difficult to have your voice heard. Those groups disproportionately side with one political party over the other. We can take, you can take my political science class and figure out which one that is. And, you know, they, there are uh, arguments that those sides will present that are not anti-democratic in nature, but the, the, the end is, you know, it, we come to the same end where people who are uh, 
of lower income, lower socioeconomic status, uh, have a much more difficult time participating in the political process than those that are more affluent, that are more well situated in society. And that just continually, it's a, it's a, a, a cycle that feeds in on itself that leads to unrepresentative outcomes from government. And it, it's, it's hard to square with our I, I, ideals that we would associate with democracy. And so, you know, th these barriers are very important. Some of them are very visible. You know, there have been lots of, uh, you know, recent coverage of things like voter ID laws and, and uh, systematic attempts at uh, disenfranchising groups of people. But some of them are much, much subtler like the fact that Iowa uses a caucus. Caucuses require you to show up, debate the, ca the candidates that are going to participate, spend a couple, you know, you know, spending a large amount of time on a work night debating who should be the nominee for a particular political party. And as a result, you know, the people who participate in the Iowa caucus, they're significantly older, whiter, more highly educated, more wealthy, than, than, the, than the population of the state. And as a result, you, know, you can imagine that if you are not allowing or not providing the opportunity for a representative sample of the population to participate, that the outcomes are going to be skewed in one way or the other. And so you know, that's another thing that, that political science helps us understand is these, these barriers, these structural barriers to what classes am I teaching in the spring? In the spring, I'm going to be teaching, I think the, it's cross-listed with history and I think it's currently called like money, power and politics. Um, the US money and power, I have it pulled up right US now. US money and power. The second one and they do a series of one and two. Oh, okay. I, I'm gonna have to, I think I'm in charge of, is this, am I teaching one or two? I'm teaching two, oh goodness. So I should find out what we did in one. Um, it's going to be it's going to be different than than how this class was taught in the past, just because I'm me. Um, but it, it's going to be focused. Uh, it's going to be focused on how the financial system in the United States and essentially, you know, the 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 post World War II financial order was established, with equal parts how how money skews outcomes in the political process. And so there's going to be a, 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 a large representational component to, to that class. Um, I am teaching another class that I've never taught before. So this, this will be, uh, all of you will be guinea pigs, um, politics and film and literature. And we're gonna focus on dystopian literature and films. And so talking about, you know, if we, if we see how these societal processes uh, spin out of control into worst case scenarios. What can that tell us about, you know, our actual day to day lives and, and how politics actually operates? And I'm teaching my, uh, it, it's listed as, it's called collective action, but it's gonna be primarily a class on political parties and interest groups and how they organize uh, a, a large degree of our, uh, political world. So I'll be teaching those three classes in the So I guess as a more personal question for me, I'm part of the Southern Oregon College Republicans and currently on campus we don't even have a Democrats club because nobody has sprung up interest and it makes it really frustrating because typically in the past we would work side by side with each other, running meetings along with each other, having debates on current events and that kind of stuff. How would you suggest for a group of people, all of us think pretty similar in terms of a political spectrum, that we widen our political views to at least understand the other side better? The first thing that I recommend is that everybody should read Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. It's a book on moral and developmental and social psychology and what it does is it just highlights how humans think 
And th the reason that I think this is very important is it highlights that us thinking happens after we've already made our decisions. Our guts and our intuitions and our instincts make almost all of our decisions. And then we use our rational brain to justify those decisions. And as soon as you can kind of begin to feel that, like, like the best example is like, you know, if, if you, you get in a fight with your partner about something, you will come up with any rationalization for your own behavior after the fact that you never had before when you were, when you were making this bad decision. You know, you will, you will try and justify it in any way possible. And that's how we think about just about everything. Thinking critically about what government should do and, and how policy should be implemented and things like this, it's really hard. And like your brain instinctually doesn't wanna do it. Why should I waste energy having all these deep, hard thoughts when I can just take my gut instinct, shoot it out into the world, and then really quick come up with a retroactive justification for that belief? And so it, like, once you get to, once you kind of internalize that and, and you, you catch yourself doing it a couple times on small things, like a fight with your partner, like you know, on a phone call with your parents trying to justify whatever, you know, whatever mistake I've been making. Um, once you catch yourself doing it once on something small, you'll start to catch yourself doing it on things that are big. And then once you can do that, you can, you can begin to realize that the opinions that you really, really deeply hold, you don't actually hold as deeply as you think you do. And you're much more open to compromise and much more open to debate on those issues when you realize, how little you actually care about most things. <laughs> that is great. I've been looking for it. <laughs> I'm going to go get it at the library, the bookstore, so, at so Barnes and Nobles. Um, the, the Righteous Mind, The Righteous Mind, and Thinking Fast and Slow by Dan Kahneman. Although Dan Kahneman has just like a two hour TED talk on Thinking Fast and Slow. So you could probably just watch that instead of reading the book, because that book is, Thinking Fast and Slow is a thick book. Um, or, or, hear me out, hear me out, you don't do any of that reading, and you just take my class next term, and it's the assigned reading for the class, so it'll be fine. <laughs> the overwhelmingness of, like, voting, because when you vote, it's like you're voting on a lot of things that affect a lot of people. So how do you think people can kind of um, think about it, but not think about that? Because that, I think that's like, that's one thing that kind of disincentivizes people to not vote is it's so, um, yeah, I, I, no, I, I get what you're saying. You know, there's a, there's a political science paper that has a really fun title that I love. And it's, why is there so little money in politics? Which you think, like you, you know, you think there's there's so much money in politics. These presidential elections cost billions of dollars, and corporations are spending billions of dollars. But the federal budget is hundreds of billions of dollars of discretionary funding. You know, what government does is monumentally influential. And the fact that like uh, we're only spending about like two billion dollars over the, on the fight of how we're going to spend seven trillion dollars a year. That's not that much money for for such a huge payoff. Like, you know what government does is monumentally influential in, in to the most you know minute minutia of of your day to day life. And so I, I'm completely sympathetic to people who are overwhelmed by the weight of the decision. I I think that. I think that it's beyond the outcome, beyond, beyond the ends that comes from you voting. I think that it is you know, your, your, your obligation as a citizen of a democracy to make your voice heard. And you know, that's work, it's hard, but that's what makes the system work because democracies only continue to function if everybody considers them legitimate. And you're only going to consider it legitimate if you have your, your seat at the table, if you have your say in the process. And the more people who kind of go, 
uh, it doesn't matter who wins, like nothing's going to change in my life or, or, you know, like uh, it's too big of a decision. I don't, that's, that's people opting out of democracy. And the more people that opt out for democracy, you're leaving it into the hands of people who may or may not have your best interests at heart. And so it's hard, it's work, it's an obligation, but it's, it's the obligation that, that we get from all the benefits of living in a free society and a ostensibly free society for did that kind of get to your question yeah that's a, that's a lot to take in so like me hearing that is like oh my that's like even more stuff to think about like that <laughs> like <laughs> and uh but yeah like i want to i want to get more like knowledge and like perspective on that because yeah and it's hard. It's a lifelong process. For example, I received my PhD in political science from a wonderful university, well, well known in the field. I go into vote, like, in no, like, I get my PhD in June, I go to vote in November, and I'm looking at the ballot. And I'm like, that's my member of Congress. Like, I thought I lived in a different congressional district than I actually lived in. And I'm a PhD in political science whose sole job it is, is to know how political institutions work. Like, like it's hard to be informed. It's why political parties are so pervasive and so pernicious and so, so overarching in our political system is because they, they do provide very useful shortcuts for people. You know, if you know that one political party eight times out of 10 agrees with you. Why learn more when you can just, ah, yeah, they'll mess up sometimes, but they're going to be right more than they're wrong and just opt out of, of you know, thinking too much about, about it. And while what government does is, is tremendously monumental, influences almost every aspect of your life, you know, your single vote is very rarely going to tip the scales one way or another. And so, you know, there are these competing incentives. What, what government does is tremendously important. What you contribute to that process is, is a much smaller share of a bigger story. And so, you know, that's, it, if there was a solution to this, if I knew, I would be like the richest person in the whole wide world, because I would have, I would have solved I would have solved a democracy, um, and, and you know nobody has. It's it's a thing we're all going to have to work on together, and it's the that internal struggle that you're you're balancing is the democratic process at work. It, it that's your your brain working on these really hard problems. Well, thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, I, it was great to get to hear from you outside of class, especially, and you wonderful conversations. I'm probably going to drop by your office hours uh, eventually to continue this. Um, but thank you so much for doing this with us. And I think that's kind of it for the meeting. Um, it's kind of our final question. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs>